So today we're lucky enough to have Nahian on the channel. So Nahian is one of my university friends that is working as a machine learning engineer at Woolies X. He's previously done internships at Atlassian and Telstra. So welcome Nahian. It's a pleasure to have you on the channel. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Samanve. Great introduction. Yeah, so my name is Nahian um, and I'm working as a machine learning engineer currently at Woolies X. I am um, an immigrant to, in Australia, so I've been here for six years. I started uh, a Bachelor of Computer Science degree at the University of Sydney back in 2016. That's where I obviously met Samanve. Back then he was a rocket scientist, to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things now. Oh, what a pivot. <laughs> but pretty interesting. Uh, and I was a software engineer by practice, so here I am. You, you never know where life takes you. Yeah, about myself. So I like dabbling in a lot of stuff, uh, particularly to do with tech. <clears throat> I like lots of core principles around software engineering, data engineering, as well as data sciences. You could think of me as like a polyglot of like different tech things coming all together. It's like a jack of all trades, master of none. Amazing. Yeah, I find myself uh, very passionate about very niche technologies. For example, um, uh, I like working quite a fair bit with cloud solutions to optimize for databases, for example, because that's what I did my thesis in. So by practice, I'm like a database optimization scientist, if you can think about it that way. Amazing. But yeah, um, I've pivoted to a lots of things. So Great. I also run a startup, by the way. So uh, there's that. And you mentioned that uh, you immigrated to Australia. So where did you immigrate from? Uh, so I'm originally from Bangladesh, born and brought up in Bangladesh. I did my uh, high school there, um, obviously, and came uh, directly. Actually, no, I took a gap year after my high school ended. So took a year in between to figure things out and get into the right headspace before coming to Australia. Great. That's good to know a little bit about yourself. Uh, so you mentioned you studied uh, computer science. Um, so why, what was the decision making behind studying the degrees? Yeah, I think that comes back to that one year I had in between, uh, between my high school and uh, my degree. So uh, actually, I was more passionate about the natural sciences, particularly physics was the love of my life. <laughs> and then I realized uh, I was pretty bad at it <laughs> compared to sort of some of the peers I came across at the time. Some of those guys I know are research scientists at CERN um, and oh, wow. uh, some of the high profile, um, you know, uh, astrophysics uh, uh, research centers around the world. And then I decided, OK, maybe I should pivot into something I'm uh, more comfortable with. And then I did a programming class for about a few months. And then I decided, hey, this looks fun. I can, I can make pyramids uh, using code. Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's essentially where it started. Um, and it sort of led me to a pathway where I thought, you know, computer science, in particular, back at the time, you don't think about computer science. You think more so about programming and coding when you're starting out. It's like, yeah. hey, it's magic. You, you, you get to tell a computer to do things, and it just listens to you. And I think that principle sort of carries over to the rest of the things you want to do in this space. I, for one, um, so I also taught at the university for a few years, um, uh, some core programming concepts, as well as some data science. Uh, That's doing your bachelor's well. degree, right? That's doing my bachelor's degree. And I, I've always <clears throat> said this about computer sciences. I think it's the closest thing to magic you have in this world that, that you can manipulate yourself. Um, and that's how I still feel about it. And that's what keeps me going. That's beautiful. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned you took a gap year, right? And mm -hmm. that's something I didn't really do. So I'd love to hear your perspective on how helpful that gap year was. And I'm sure a lot of viewers are also finishing high school and they're kind of thinking, or maybe they're a bit confused as to what to do next. So how did that gap year kind of influence the rest of your life after? Yeah, I think that period of my life was a very pivotal point in my life. It sort of leads uh, back to what 
why I took a gap year. So back at the time, I was applying for a lot of U.S. universities, mm. and I'll be flat out like I I got good SAT scores, but I didn't quite get into the universities that I wanted to back in the day. And ultimately, deciding on Australia because I had a lot of family here. But during that time, it was all about your mental headspace, right? Mm. So. Before coming to another country, uh, especially if you don't have any support, you have to get into this headspace of needing to be independent and yep. knowing to control sort of your emotions on a daily basis. I might be overhyping it a little bit. Some to some people, it does come naturally, but to a certain extent, I think it's understanding the level of expectation that you need to have of yourself. Mm. In particular, if you're kind of an overachiever or someone who's achieved good things in high school, totally different ball game when you come to a university. Totally. So <laughs> totally different ball game. I completely agree with you there. Yeah. So you're everyday dopamine rush uh, from trying to do a better university it's just gonna stop <laughs> yes <laughs> you start getting those 90 plus in all your subjects <laughs> yeah it's 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 definitely 90 percent of the cases is not happening even if you, you know you love you're passionate about something yeah there will always be some things that are just over the top and not meant for you over the long run and you tend to realize that slowly as you go that said um i think uh the general the general bit is setting those expectations for you and that gap year let me decide what those expectations for myself was and let me be in a he healthy mental Amazing. state as I enter university, which I want to sort of add on is I did not see among some of my peers who actually emigrated without a gap year, like mm. their their expectations were quite different. I, I got to hear lots of experiences from my friends abroad who had already oh, been yeah. uh, uh, out for a year. So I was able to get into that headspace early on. But it does hit some people really hard when they yep. come directly after high school. Yeah, amazing. That's a great lesson for anyone that's watching and anyone that's thinking about moving overseas for studies. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. It's quite far from that, like, especially when you kind of idealize it for so long. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. So you took the gap year, you got into computer science at uh, University of Sydney. So tell us a little bit about what the degree was like. <clears throat> Put me in a tough spot because uh, I taught at the university as well. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the computer science degree has certainly evolved since I started there. But my experience was pretty stock standard, I'd say. Um, we had uh, lots of programming courses, uh, lots of DSA, data structures and algorithms. Yep. Um, but... Also, in my case, towards the later years of my degree, I pivoted to a lot of machine learning and data science, but you have the opportunity to go to any niche you want to do. So with computer science, I think you want to pick a certain niche uh, yeah. that you really find enjoyable mm -hmm. and um, sort of expand on that uh, continu continually throughout your career. With the University of Sydney, I think there's lots of great courses, some great lectures, not all of them, some very useful units, some not so much. I think yeah. it's a bit of a hit or a miss. You you, yeah. you should try out your courses towards the uh, start of your semester. If you don't like them, just switch them yeah. out. Uh, I yeah. think that's that's a general rule of thumb. Amazing. Cool. So you've also done a couple of internships during your university degrees, right? So can you tell us a little bit about those internships and what they were like? So. Internships are a tricky thing. I started my first one at minimum wage. Uh, this was back in second year. I was working as a bit of a junior analyst for a little bit. They, and then I transitioned into a bit of DevOps and I did this part-time for a year. And then I got internships at Telstra at the end of summer and at Atlassian towards the end of my third year as well. With internships, you just got to be very smart about people you interact with. It's It all comes down to networking at the end of the day. So, for instance, I uh, got my interview at Atlassian through a colleague tutor. 
at the time. Yeah, uh, he he'd got a grad role at Atlassian, yep. and, and uh, he referred me for an internship position. The hardest bit about an interview, if you don't know already, um, I think most of your viewers know, is getting through the resume screening process. Yeah. And if, you, if, <laughs> if you have the referral, you you're automatically considered from uh, that pool. So <clears throat> that's the hack. So once you have that referral, you just try your best to get through the interview process. Not saying that the interview process isn't hard, but yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a different that's that's a different story altogether. Yeah, that's awesome. So you got those internships, and how did those internships change the way you thought about work? Did you think it prepared you for the work after you graduated? Yeah, I I definitely think the internships were some of the most high value that's experiences great, you know? that's come out of um, in my career. I think it depends on what kind of an internship it is. I know some people who haven't had the best, best experiences, yeah. but you need to be careful about who you're working with. Right? I think it boils down to the people you work with in your internships and yeah. whether there is a structure to grow and develop you. Thankfully for uh, you know, at Telstra and Atlassian, we had that structure because there mm. were structured internship programs. And I learned heaps uh, just the way how an organization and squads and teams and agile yeah. and all of that uh, work is quite important to um, it's quite important to sort of mold yourself into that uh, system yeah. uh, because that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life yeah um, totally. and yeah it, it, it tends to help you get that uh, set that expectation for that nine to five journey you might potentially be doing for a long time in your life course, who doesn't do that journey even if you're you have your own company it's probably worse than that right <laughs> okay so you've gone through your degree you've done a couple of internships so um what inspired you to become a machine learning engineer hmm it's a it's an interesting question i think um towards the end of my third and fourth year i was as i mentioned previously pivoting towards data science and machine learning that was primarily due to the fact that uh, <laughs> everyone was getting uh, into it <laughs> <laughs> kind of <laughs> like there was everyone getting into it i was uh, also sort of influenced by uh uh, you know, I, I, I read this book called Deep Learning uh, with Python by Francois Cholet at the time. Oh, yeah. um, it's, it's one of the books that gets you started with TensorFlow and Keras and yeah. Deep Learning. Uh, it's a really good book. Uh, Francois Cholet, he's, he's sort of the inventor of Keras and Google. Amazing. Um, this guy makes it really easy to get into deep learning and machine learning in particular mm. uh, in that book. Back at the time, it was, you think machine learning, you think, oh, it's, you know, inputs, models, outputs, yeah. and call it a day. And, <laughs> and that's how you effectively get started. And that's how it pulls you in. True, you know? true. <laughs> Towards graduating university, I, I was talking to a professor um, and he referred me to this startup that was looking for a machine learning engineer. I was like, hey, this sounds like a good opportunity. Uh, a machine learning engineer at a startup, I'll probably have lots of, you know, uh, op like lots of room to experiment and try out different things. Uh, wouldn't necessarily have to, uh, you know, stick to your classical machine learning. And that's, it sort of led me to that entry point where I got to learn heaps and heaps about not just machine learning, but uh, you know, this startups, data engineering, as well as cloud infrastructure. And I worked with mm. some great guys there um, who taught me a lot of things. Uh, I, awesome. I think that's been my journey. It's, it's a bit yeah. awkward, but I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't oh, say great. it's very That's... different for lots of people. Yeah. yeah, I think data science is one of those fields where everyone is coming from different walks of life and getting into it. Very non-traditional. Cool. So you found your first job through a kind of mix of networking and luck, et cetera. And you've been a machine learning engineer for a number of years now. You're yep. already working at your second company now. How is being a machine learning engineer different to being a data scientist. Data scientists get a lot of lot of time in the spotlight and machine learning engineer is only starting to come up these days. Yeah, I think there's two parts to this answer. Um, 
obviously number one is um, sort of the theoretical differences between data science and machine learning. I think um, you know, there's a, there was this Venn diagram by Drew Conway, uh, this dude was like a machine learning data science advocate. Um, so he, he drew a Venn diagram where you have like one side is hacking skills and there's like um, uh, domain expertise and then there's like statistics and computational mathematics and it's like if you have all three intercrossing that's like a data science and then just on top of that between hacking skills and <laughs> math and probability that's like where machine learning lies oh, nice. um, uh, it, classically, machine learning is refers to sort of your supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning. That, those are the three niches. Yeah. You have foundational machine learning, AI yeah. coming through as well. Uh, but in practice, it's it's widely. I think it 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 widely varies across yeah. um, most most particularly I think industries as well as uh, even among companies as well. From my experience, um, machine learning engineer has to be across at least uh, three main principles. So you have to have the fundamentals of data science, hmm. um, uh, you know, your classical machine learning, uh, that which it falls under. Secondly, you have to be uh, comfortable with data engineering. Yeah. Uh, and this is a part that is often, I think, overlooked. Mm. Um, even though there are lots of careers explicitly in data engineering, um, yep. you are expected as a machine learning engineer to yep. know how to, you know, wrangle data and make sense out of it. Yep. Uh, and uh, thirdly, you have to be across core software engineering principles as well, because gotcha. ultimately, machine learning sort of um, machine learning engineer in the wider industry sort of encapsulates the entire machine learning pipeline that you would yep. build um, across for that company. Uh, and that would be your responsibility as the machine learning engineer, whereas the data scientists would fill in sort of one one of those three parts. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great description. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think I'd just like to quickly highlight as, as a data scientist, I think, more mature companies now also expect data engineering mm -hmm. expertise from data scientists yeah. where it's kind of very similar type roles. Awesome. Cool. So um, what does your typical work day look like? Oh, typical work day. It's uh, in right now, mostly working from home, but <laughs> Uh, if 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 I get uh, get up early enough, I usually go out for a morning walk and a coffee. I'll usually double shot uh, skin <laughs> cappuccino. <laughs> oh. um, uh, and my stand-ups have been moved to eleven, but usually they were at nine a.m. So yep. you do your morning coffee, you stand up, um, and then I usually that's when I get most of my work done right yeah. after my stand-up because that's when um, my th that's how my pattern works yeah. uh, usually effective until lunch hour for a little mm. bit yeah. um, and then typically I tend to put my meetings towards the later half of the day so that mm. it doesn't take away you know that it doesn't influence that context switching that you have to do yeah, between totally. work and meetings um, and then after I uh, finish off my meetings towards the end of the day. I usually uh, fill in those pieces that other teammates might need from me towards mm -hmm. the later end of the day. Um, and I typically end around 4, 4.30 p.m. about an hour early because I start, start a bit earlier as well. What would be the ratio of you coding versus meetings? I think it depends on the time of the year. For instance, um, it was just end of financial year. Uh, we had to we had to do a lot of uh, plannings for the next quarter, et cetera, et cetera. So those those intense periods of planning definitely require a lot of meetings. Um, thankfully, in my case, um, I, I, I definitely have the room to skip meetings if I need to. But yeah, there are lots, <laughs> there are lots of meetings, but I typically only attend the ones that are mostly relevant for my project. Um, and 
maybe skip out on the ones that are like tribe wide or practice wide. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a tribe is, a tribe is effectively a collection of different squads under one principle. So uh, that's what a tribe is. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And for anyone that hasn't heard that before, that's very similar to how Spotify operates its um, engineering teams. So I'll leave a link in the description if anyone's interested in how that all works. Anyway, uh, cool. So how do you keep up to date with the latest developments in your industry? I think this varies uh, for me personally from time to time, um, particularly because um, I work across uh, a lot of domains. And for instance, I usually get sucked into things very quickly if there's like a new fancy technology that's out there. Um, for uh, Even if it's not new, uh, for instance, like uh, I was working on a... I was working on a back-end um, tech uh, for one of my projects, um, and I was using, uh, I believe, Firestore to get some information. Um, and then I realized I had to, uh, m my my software was bottlenecking on data transfer over the network. It's like. I can't verify what why this is happening, and so then I jumped into this thing called Open Telemetry recently, mm. um, and then Open Telemetry led to things like uh, Google Cloud Trace or Jaeger or you know all those uh, tracing tools that exist to monitor the performance of your applications, um, and it it sort of it, for me, it takes the route of like, if you're engaged in a project, uh, you move from, you know, one thing to another and then discover, all right, this is the standard for that software. And then you, I personally like to get into the documentation for those projects. Uh, you have your GitHub, um, lots of medium articles as well. Um, and then I try to do a cursory reading at first to understand, hey, is, is this something I really need and I really like? Um, if I don't need it, I'll probably push it into some personal project of mine. Uh, for example, I'm working on uh, a gRPC IO uh, based server because uh, I've worked with things like REST, GraphQL, and thought it's time to move on to gRPC. Like for those of you who don't know, those are like some of the three main backend uh, protocols for uh, communication. Um, and then because I'm using open telemetry at work, I've been sort of focusing on, hey, this is a new tech for observability of your backend up applications. Um, and it's even um, sort of, uh, it's endorsed by Google uh, in all of their documentations as well. So I, I, I tend to think like these are some really cool uh, sort of pathways you can take and learn about different kinds of software as you work on a project. Uh, for me, it comes through practice. Uh, for some people, that might not be the case, but I, I feel like if you're someone who likes um, doing things hands-on, uh, pick a project, pick some boilerplate um, code that you find on GitHub and do something that you find interesting. Um, and you'll keep up to date automatically. <laughs> Great. I think that brings me to my next question. So what's your advice for someone who wants to be a machine learning engineer? I think number one is uh, setting your expectations. Uh, correct. <laughs> See, machine learning, as I've mentioned, is is it varies widely across the industry. I think there's some new roles that machine learning scientists as well, um, MLOps, yeah, I'm I'm actually part of MLOps now. Um, yeah, so, but it it depends on the track you want to take. So I believe there's two tracks primarily. One is very industry focused. The other is research. Some uh, companies do take R and D in machine learning. That's a very different pathway to if you want to go to stock and standard engineering. Um, I can speak a lot about the engineering side of things. Um, so in particular, I think if you're starting out of university or out of high school, okay, if you're, if you're starting out 
uh, in general, for machine learning, you should have very good principles of probability, statistics, linear algebra, uh, uh, first and f foremost. You should also probably be comfortable with software um, and in for machine learning in particular should be uh, comfortable with cloud infrastructure as well as particularly kubernetes uh, nowadays so that that's a very big backbone of um do you think of... it's necessary for people that have never worked in machine learning to know that right off the bat i definitely think that um, you should be at least familiarized with Docker, yeah, okay. Docker and containers. Yeah, totally. Um, yep. Because in industry, at least nowadays, almost everything runs in inside Kubernetes and containers. Yep. Um, I could be wrong. Someone in the comments might fact fact check me <laughs> right now. No, um, I agree with you. So, so many of the companies I've worked in, it's like a default in machine learning these days. It is. It is quite a default. There's there's that aspect of running your models on Kubernetes with lots of yep. uh, frameworks like Argo workflows, uh, yeah. Kubeflow. Um, and Google has its own offering called Vertex AI. It's basically like oh, a yeah. wrapper around Kubeflow. <laughs> mm. And uh, for machine learning engineers, I think that's very uh, important, as well as data engineering uh, practices as well. Uh, yeah. It's a very understated uh, aspect. I think for mm. data engineering, you need to be at least familiar with sort of your uh, MapReduce model. Uh, that's yep. very common across the board. It doesn't matter what you choose. It could be yep. uh, Spark, uh, you know, Flink, Beam, etc., etc. Mm. et cetera. Uh, definitely be aware of that as well as uh, understanding database optimizations uh, yep. I, um, because at the end of the day, you need to know how to interact with your database and whether you're making the right choice for your storage layer um, and um, things like that see all of that come boils down to that you know millisecond improvement that you can bring mm. uh, to your mm -hmm. processes yeah cool. so why should anyone be a machine learning engineer <laughs> why should anyone put me on a spot but i personally enjoy the fact that and i've learned to appreciate this lately um yep. is the fact that i have so much room to play around with so many different things. Um, yep. So I I do have the opportunity to uh, work with some of the algorithms and the models that the data scientists come up with. Um, yep. I have the room to work with cloud infra, the room to work with uh, different kinds of backend technologies, mm -hmm. um, the room to work with different kinds of databases, I have the room to work with different kinds of observability, um, site reliability uh, systems. So you have to sort of, um, it might vary across industry to industry or company to company, but yeah. in general, you do have that opportunity to work across a wide range of things as a machine learning engineer. Gotcha. And I, I think that's one of the lucrative points um, of being Amazing. machine learning. Yeah. That's so cool. Awesome. So um, talking about lucrative, um, so what do the salaries of machine learning look like in terms of how do they compare to data scientists? Is it kind of more or less than data scientists or is it about the same and you know um to be honest i'm not across the data science data scientist salaries in australia but mm. um for machine learning um sort of on a mid to junior role you would be looking at um sort of a six-figure salary i think quite yep. easily um yeah and even these days i'm hearing even people that are graduates are starting off with like six-figure salaries which is pretty crazy considering you know when we started in data science a number yeah. of years ago that was not the reality for sure <laughs> i heard a grad getting uh 180k as a starting salary so, that's so crazy people have worked for years and years <laughs> yeah, to get to that and then a grad comes along <laughs> it's crazy man yeah pretty crazy which is a bit dangerous in a way because mm. then it's like the people that maybe should not be in there are there because they're yeah. kind of prioritizing salary rather than yeah the work. 
Yeah, there's. I, I think that applies to lots of principles True. in 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 general, but yeah. um, for data science, I I do think it's a bit of a you know hot take right now um, mm. across the board, um, yep. and and it's very hard to find sort of people who are naturally motivated towards that mm. as opposed to import pandas uh import yeah. tensorflow <laughs> yeah uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. um and, and this sort of ties back to what i said about that research side of things because i think mm. you need to be familiar with a little bit of the uh, R&D and the mathematics around that space. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. you know, I talked about linear algebra, statistics, probability. Uh, if you dive a bit deep, you get into mm. sort of those uh, realms of cost optimizations, real analysis, yeah. um, multivariate yeah. calculus, um, and things like that. Um, and I, I believe, you know, that that's where the real machine learning uh, scientists mm. and the data scientists are. Um, well, the okay, algorithm the side of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the algorithm side of things. Yeah. You know, if, if you're a data scientist practitioner, um, you know, it, you you have to understand sort of the, the distribution uh, of the domain that you are currently mm. in to sort of mm. come up with the right choices. And I think yeah. that's, that's probably what the core focus of a data scientist yeah. Uh, and a machine learning engineer should be overall. Totally, yeah. yeah. It's more about applications rather than coming up with seemingly cutting edge things or yeah. diving very deep in mathematics, etc. Right? Yeah, yeah. And that's not everyone's, most people's yeah. cup of tea, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Speaking more to a, from like an immigration perspective, did you have trouble finding a job after you graduated as an international student? What was the story there? It is quite complex in Australia, the system for the job opportunities between mm. uh, PRs and citizens versus non, uh, non-PRs and citizens. So if you are an immigrant, um, it's, it, you shouldn't be surprised if you notice that your, the pool of jobs available to you are far less or far fewer than um, those available to PRs and citizens. Um, and, but that isn't to discourage prospective applicants, but it is the reality yeah. of um, of the situation. Um, but maybe with labor coming in, <laughs> it might be a bit different. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it still works the same way uh, in the sense that it boils down to a lot of networking you can yeah. do during your university yeah. um stages um i know that the university has lots of job and career fairs um and so Mm. on and so forth but i found the most success in just talking to people flat out um linkedin Mm. is pretty important uh you can keep up to date with who's gotten into where and uh, you know Mm. and if if you have someone who's a senior at a particular place uh Mm. you definitely reach out to them um to get those referrals in um, and yeah. make your life a lot easier. Totally. Yeah. The key thing I'm getting is referral is really the best way to kind of get your foot in the door in the whole job interview. Process. I definitely think so. It's really hard to differentiate yourself from like a million other interviewees. Awesome. So I guess last question. So we've talked a lot about work and machine learning. So what do you like to do in your free time? So in my free time, play a lot of online games, unhealthy amounts of online nice. games. Typical software engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Just a mattress on, on my, in my room <laughs> and nothing else. Um, but I do have Don't a... Don't tell me the mattress is on the floor. Yeah, it is, but I do have a sick, yeah, uh, I do have a sick setup. But yeah, there it yeah. is. Um, I've got it. a RTX 3060, uh, which I use oh, yeah. uh, for lots of gaming and sometimes yep. deep learning um, <laughs> applications. <I love> it. <laughs> <laughs> but even for their projects, people are using the cloud. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, I love it, it. but it, it is a good investment, I think, uh, the RDX 360. Yeah. It's got 12 gigs of RAM, so you can load like big models into it as well. That's solid. Yep. Yep. Um, that's great. Yeah, and I, I play the guitar uh, sometimes, but that's about it. Awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Nahian, for this wonderful interview. I think my viewers got quite a lot out of this and hopefully it helps them out. Yep. And um, what is the best place for my viewers to reach you if they're looking for any specific advice or they just want to say hi? Um, uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, it's my... Perfect. Yeah. Um, my tag is slash bit nahian on LinkedIn. Yep. You want to find I'll, me? I'll chuck that in the description. So awesome. Thanks a lot, Nahian. Thanks, Samuel. Really appreciate it. Yep.